Howdy, I'm Bill Olson and this is another week of Free Speech Zone and uh, I have this mask here because last week we had so much stuff going on we didn't get to cover Guy Fox Day, too bad. I carried this around in my car, luckily I never got uh, stopped by a police officer. It would have been interesting to see him ask me about why this was in my glove compartment. You know, am I some sort of a terrorist or what? Well, anyway, uh, basically the elections that happened last week showed me that the electoral populace still doesn't get it. They're voting for Democrats. They're voting for Republicans. They're, what are they, stupid? I mean, by this time, how many times over and over and over and over again have you heard the excuses, the lies, and uh, basically everything? And you still go for it? Oh well. Well, what I want to drum into you is that we really have a corrupt government that is absolutely evil by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm not talking about demons and angels and stuff. I'm talking about something that's really vicious. And uh, we're going to start out the show with James Corbett's 9-11. Uh, it's a five-minute uh, recap of the official story. So you'll know the lies that they go through, and then we'll proceed from there to, sh to kind of straighten out the truth. So go ahead and take it away. This is James Corbett. On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination because nobody in our government at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, him, 
him and her, and her and her and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of the incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater, and will be reviled by everyone. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, SEC, MSM, White House, NIST, and the 9-11 Commission. Because ignorance is strength. All right, ignorance is strength. Boy, I really like that. It, it gets out so much in just four minutes, 55 seconds. Okay, so now we're going to get more serious, and we're going to start telling it the way it is. And we have James Corbett again. He's so good at this stuff, and he's got a 15-minute uh, little mini-documentary about the uh, American manufactured terror. Let's just uh, take it from there. James Corbett, we'll be back in 14 minutes. The Boston Marathon bombing has provoked shock, grief, and outrage from around the world. After decades of conditioning, the public automatically equates such terrorism with Muslim radicals. But the evidence shows that every major terror plot on American soil in the past 10 years has been fostered, funded and equipped by one organization, the FBI. This is the GRTV Backgrounder on Global Research TV. People around the world watched in horror this week as explosions rocked the finish line of the Boston Marathon, turning a day of sportsmanship and celebration into one of shock, grief, and outrage. As with all such events, the desire to discover who was behind this cowardly act has driven many into a speculative frenzy. And, in a sad reminder of the indoctrination that the Western world has been under for over a decade now in the mythical War of Terror, it did not take long at all before the collective finger of the mob was pointed squarely in the direction of Muslim terrorists. Within hours of the blast, fear spread throughout the international Muslim community that the bombing would be connected to an Islamist extremist. A Libyan Twitter user touched a nerve and received hundreds of retweets and worldwide media coverage by tweeting, please don't be a Muslim. The backlash began shortly thereafter, with the New York Post falsely implying that a Saudi national was being questioned for his possible role in the attack. The next day, a plane departing Boston Logan Airport returned to the gate, and two passengers were forcibly removed because they had been overheard speaking Arabic before takeoff. As data continues to pour in regarding the bombing and who may be behind it, it is important that we take a moment to step back and consider this knee-jerk tendency to conclude that this is the work of Islamic radicals. In the minds of millions of Americans, bombs targeting innocents on U.S. soil are inextricably linked with the image of the bearded, turban-wearing boogeyman that has become the shorthand for evil in this age of terror. This association is not only incorrect, it is dangerously incorrect because it signally fails to identify the one unifying thread between all of the recent terror plots in the U.S. Lurking behind the shadowy armies of would-be jihadis in the popular imagination is the sober reality that every single major terror bust in the United States since 9-11 has sourced back to the same group, a single entity that is in every single case funded, equipped, and even incited the would-be terrorists into action. The FBI. In 2005, federal prosecutors charged Michael Reynolds, a 47-year-old drifter living with his elderly mother, of attempting to wage jihad on the U.S. by blowing up fuel facilities. 
He was arrested after agreeing to meet with an FBI informant who had promised him $40,000 for his cause, and two months later the FBI quietly announced he was likely mentally ill. In 2007, the so-called Fort Dix Six were nabbed in a much-hyped FBI terror bust after allegedly hatching a plan to attack a U.S. military base and kill the soldiers there. At the time, a 26-page indictment revealed that the group had no rigorous military training and did not appear close to being able to pull off an attack. The next year, it was revealed that the FBI informant who had infiltrated the group had in fact offered to organize the members and lead the plot itself. In 2009, the Newburg Four were arrested for an alleged plot to blow up synagogues and shoot down military airplanes in Newburgh, New York. The group was a ragtag bunch of poor black men, at least one of whom was mentally unstable and stored his own urine in jars around his apartment. The group's fifth member, Shahad Hussein, turned out to be an FBI informant who had promised the members hundreds of thousands of dollars to carry out the plot. In sentencing the defendants, federal judge Colleen McMahon said, the government created acts of terrorism out of the defendant's fantasies of bravado and bigotry, and then made those fantasies come true. The government did not have to infiltrate and foil some nefarious plot. There was no nefarious plot to foil. In November 2010, the FBI busted the so-called Portland Christmas tree bomber, who was allegedly attempting to bomb the lighting ceremony at Portland's Pioneer Courthouse Square. The threat was very real, the FBI intoned at the time. Our investigation shows that Mohammed was absolutely committed to carrying out an attack on a very grand scale. The alleged bomber, Arthur Balazan, turned out to be a teenager who bragged to undercover agents that he could get a gun because he was a rapper and wrote an article on workout tips for jihadis. In 2011, the FBI arrested a man that they themselves had supplied with a remote-controlled plane and C-4 explosives in a harebrained attempt to bomb the Pentagon. In 2012, they busted another would-be jihadi that they again had supplied with a fake gun and suicide vest. Also in 2012, the FBI busted a group of five anarchists who were allegedly going to bomb a bridge in the Cleveland area, although it was quietly admitted that the FBI informant who had infiltrated the group had in fact initiated the contact with them and been present at the meetings where they developed the plan to blow up the bridge. One of the most ridiculous examples of this pattern dates back to 2006, when the DOJ attempted to make it seem as if they had just nabbed a group of dangerous jihadis who were preparing a full ground war against the United States. Now, fortunately, because of the fine work of law enforcement, these men were unable to advance their deadly plot. A dreadful potential catastrophe averted. And clearly, government wouldn't bother to hold a press conference if this were not a major step in the war on terror, right? All right, so good night, everybody. And, oh, I'm sorry, uh, questions. <laughs> Did the uh, 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 man have any actual contact with any members of Al-Qaeda that you know of? Any... Yeah. The, the, answer to that, the answer to that is no. Did you find any explosives, weapons? No, and you raise a, a good point. You do raise a good point, uh, that point being that these deadly international terrorists had very slyly disguised themselves as a bunch of dip living in a warehouse. The picture that is painted by these facts is as overwhelming as it is difficult for much of the public to comprehend. The conclusion, nevertheless, is incontrovertible. That without the FBI, many of the so-called terrorist cells that have been hatching their inept, bumbling schemes against the United States for decades might never have existed at all. Despite what many would believe, this conclusion is not even controversial. Rather, it has been backed up time and again by evidence in the official record and multiply attested to by FBI insiders and whistleblowers themselves. Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. Correspondent Jacqueline Adams has the story. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. When a urea nitrate explosive um, is detonated, it, it, the urea nitrate breaks into urea and nitrate. Nitrate ions, urea is out there. 
And we found high concentrations of urea at the World Trade Center. And we found urea nitrate explosive at, at a bomb-making factory, which we could point back to the, uh, the folks at the, um, <coughs> that were the suspects. And um, I wrote a report that we found urea nitrate ions, and that was consistent with the presence of a urea nitrate-based explosive. However, it was also consistent with um, the urea, which is used on the streets of New York at the time, is a bio-friendly ice melter. Nitrate ions, which are in the um, acid rain belt, Urea is in sewage. It's in. It's it's coming out of your fingers right now. It's uh, you know it's something that you, it it's in urine. Uh, sewage mains burst in the crime scene. You know as a result of the explosion, World Trade Center. FBI management um, ordered my boss to tell me to take those alternative explanations for the data out of my report. And I remember the day very well. It was raining. It was dreary out on uh, on uh, E Street behind the FBI building. I was looking out the window, and I told my boss, well, they can just fire me. I'm not going to lie in this report. I'm going to lie in a court of law. Well, I mean, they just fired me because they needed somebody to lie. But um, another individual in the lab decided to just come in and give them the answer they wanted. And um, when he... When he put himself in that position, in order to convince our managers that these things were true, Steve Burmeister, um, my partner at the time, and I um, made some samples and told the fellow they came from the crime scene. One of them was uh, <coughs> was actually urine. I uh, collected my own urine in a beaker and dried it down and extracted it with uh, acetone and turn that sample over to this fellow. And then uh, Steve Burmeister mixed urea nitrate or urea fertilizer and ammonium nitrate and gave it to the guy. And his response in detecting these things was, okay, we got them now. That was urea nitrate bomb. And then we went to our manager and said, well, here's the problem. And this is what's going to catch you when you get to court. Um, this guy is ready to declare a urea nitrate bomb. And he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not trained in explosive analysis. He doesn't understand chemistry. He doesn't even have a degree in chemistry. And yet he's being declared as your chief chemist, and you're going to put him up front. Now make a point. That's going to blow this case all apart, and it's going to show the government's going to lie in court. And so we told the manager what we did. The manager absolutely blew up at us. We couldn't. We, we, we were astonished. What, what do you mean? You know, I'm not going to. Uh, embarrass my chief chemist, and don't you ever do anything like this again. Well, you know, um, Mike Isikoff at the uh, at the Newsweek magazine at the time wrote the incident up that I was so frustrated at management, I got a beaker and urinated in it. And that's where he stopped. It made me look sort of like a fool. But that's what, you know, I, you know, I, I uh, <coughs> excuse me, I chide Mike about that all of these years when he calls me every once in a while. That isn't what happened. That is what happened was we showed that this individual, without any realization of what he was, what his data meant, was willing to make a uh, statement in a court of law that was completely false, completely, and would have made that would have very much threatened that prosecution or that case. Knowing what I know. And again, this was written 91 days before the attack. Knowing what I know, I can confidently say that until the investigative responsibilities for terrorism are removed from the FBI, I will not feel safe. The FBI has proven for the past decade it cannot identify and prevent acts of terrorism against the United States and its citizens at home and abroad. Even worse, there is virtually no effort on the part of the FBI's International Terrorism Unit to neutralize known and suspected terrorists residing within the United States. Unfortunately, more terrorist attacks against American interests coupled with the loss of American lives will have to occur before those in power give this matter the urgent attention it deserves. Realizing more American lives are going to be needlessly lost, no one should expect me to consciously sit idly by and pretend to forget the things I know. By sharing what I know, the terrorism problems plaguing America may be corrected. 
Knowing what I know, I truly believe I would be derelict in my duty as an American if I did not do my best to bring the FBI's dereliction of duty to the attention of others. Given all of this damning history and insider whistleblowing, it is vital that the Western public break out of their media-induced programming and question the core assumptions of the war on terror paradigm that we have been programmed with for decades now. If there is to be speculation at all over events like these, and if there is any group that has to present a thoroughgoing case for why it is not responsible for this atrocity, surely it is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Having been at the heart of so many terror plots in the past, both the hilariously inept and the chillingly successful, how could the public refuse to even interrogate the organization that has the most to answer for? The simple fact of the matter is that the history of the modern age of terrorism has proven time and again that the FBI is the prime suspect in any terrorist atrocity that takes place on American soil. Let us all keep this in mind as the details of the investigations into this and all other American terrorist incidents begin to emerge. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com. Okay, well, that's uh, manufactured terrorism, FBI style. Now, we've been talking about that for quite a while, and of course, when we had that, uh, uh, what was he, the, the shoe bomber or whatever he was that was going to blow up our uh, Christmas uh, celebration, uh, there were several uh, eyewitnesses, what was it, Kurt Haskell, I think that was his name, he was a lawyer from the Portland area, and he uh, spotted the... Uh, the bad guy getting put on the plane by, you know, an intelligence agent. So, you know, it's there's too much bad stuff going on in the background, and we're just beginning to cover it just barely. Now, remember, we were talking about Sibel Edmonds quite a bit lately, and one of the things that she's done recently is a very, very good analysis and, and documentary, documenting the... Documenting the uh, um, Operation Gladio. That was the uh, operation that the CIA and FBI and all the, you know, our Western intelligence, probably other intelligence agencies too, Mossad and, and of course, uh, MI6, went around blowing up things in Europe, blaming it on the enemy, you know, to justify more and more uh, militarism. Well, we're going to play a, a a Russia Today clip. It's truth seekers. Now, they've been kind of gone from the scene for a while. I don't really know what was behind that, but they're back and in full glory. Uh, the host is uh, Daniel uh, uh, Bush Alert. I think I pronounced that correctly. But anyway, uh, we're going to talk about 9-11 and Operation Gladio. And it gets more and more serious as we go on. So pay attention and realize that it's our own government that's killing us, our own government, our people, criminals, bad guys in our own government. If you, if you don't quite get grips on that, you don't have a grip on any of it. So what you have to do is understand that we are the terrorists. Okay, let's play this one. Truth Seekers. And as Daniel Bush, your top officials say the White House is behind the terrorism of their population and new evidence from 9-11. Coming up. Whistleblowers leak U.S. talks with the head of Al-Qaeda. World Trade 7 is shown on Times Square. And the father of a Twin Towers victim tells us about being attacked by mainstream media. Decades of terror against their own population blamed on extremists has actually been funded and planned by the White House. Top level officials in the government and the CIA confirmed. The campaign known as Gladio is called by former CIA head Bill Colby a quote, major operation. 
In sworn testimony, one of the conspirators confessed, you have to attack civilians, the people, women, children, far removed from any political game, so authorities can bring in a state of emergency. Dr. Daniel Ganser, author of NATO's Secret Armies, thanks very much indeed for coming on. So mainstream media don't report this, but it is now on the record and officially documented that decades of terror attacks against their own population are in fact organized by the CIA and the White House. Operation Northwoods, with evidence for, of Operation Gladio, we have the data now available. And then the people understand that this exists, um, but they still have a, a psychological moment w w where they have a hard time to believe that it still goes on because it's, it's, it's bad news, you know? It basically means that terrorism can be manipulated in order to um, in order to move people around like like sheep, really, and and if you're told you're sheep and you're being moved by by false flag terrorism, I mean this is really something you don't want to hear. Yeah, we keep finding this term strategy of tension by the White House. What does it mean? Strategy of tension uh, actually means that you blow up a bomb and say uh, your enemy did it. What we do have is um, evidence that this strategy of tension goes on. It does, it's not over. Bigger than Watergate, the FBI's Dennis Sacker calls US shielding Al-Qaeda leaders up to 2001 and reports veterans today still ongoing. FBI whistleblower Sybil Edmonds has exposed the, quote, innumerable regular meetings between US representatives and bin Laden's deputy, now head of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri, leading up to September 2001. July 2001, FBI agents closing in on the 9-11 plotters were thrown off the case and threatened with prosecution. Then, when officers arrested Mohammed Halifa, directly linked to America's most wanted terrorist, Ramzi Youssef, the Secretary of State himself intervened, had Halifa immediately deported to Saudi and released. People at the CIA were ripped, not even speaking in retrospect, but contemporaneous with what the intelligence community knew. Halifa's deportation was unreal. Dr. Kevin Barrett is the author of Questioning the War on Terror. Great to speak to you. We actually have leaders admitting these terrorists are just tools. And that's what Al-Qaeda is. It's a cat's paw for Western intelligence agencies. And we heard this from the Arab world's leading political commentator, Mohammed Haikal, who told us immediately after 9-11 that this official story of 9-11 is ridiculous. He said when he was at the highest levels of government in Europe, he was the one who was in charge of essentially uh, infiltrating and virtually running so-called Al-Qaeda. He said Al-Qaeda is full of uh, people from Saudi intelligence, from uh, U.S. intelligence, Israeli intelligence, and of course Egyptian intelligence. Uh, it couldn't do anything on its own. British scholar Nafis Ahmad, who's one of the world's leading scholars of terrorism and one of the best, uh, talks about an incident that happened in Turkey. I believe this was a little bit before 9-11 a high level, a supposed senior Al-Qaeda commander was arrested in Turkey. And the guards at the prison who were devout Muslims noticed that he wasn't praying. Uh, he was asking for pork. Uh, and they said, what, you know, I thought we thought you were a radical Muslim. And uh, he kind of laughed and, and said, uh, no, no, this is all just a, a strategy of tension. This 9-11, the world's top physicists, pilots, engineers join victims' families to sidestep the mainstream media wall of silence. Huge billboards on Times Square and across the states confront the fact most Americans don't know a third giant tower on 9-11 wasn't even hit by a plane, yet somehow collapsed in free fall. At 5.20 p.m., World Trade 7 suddenly, neatly and symmetrically just folded like a pancake. This is high school physics. A building cannot do free fall with 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system without it being blown up. The government version is that office fires made all 84 steel columns break at the same time. But there are other versions. John Cole's among thousands of leading independent experts with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Great to speak to you. So who did it? Who didn't do it is the, the 19 hijackers that allegedly flew the plane. It is impossible. It is impossible to melt that steel 
by the office fires, the jet fuel, or the collapse itself. It's a physical impossibility. It cannot be replicated experimentally. It defies the laws of physics. If you set aside your politics, you set aside your beliefs and your religion, and you use the scientific method. World Trade Center 7 is basically a classic controlled demolition that where a building free falls and comes straight down into virtually its own uh, footprint. Uh, the only explanation that explains all the evidence, the nanothermite, the, uh, the iron microspheres, the high temperatures found out there, the free fall, the uniform, what I call the uniform acceleration of the towers, when those came down, there was no impact or jolt when it hit the undamaged section below. Because there was no jolt, something blew those towers out, allowing it to, to uniformly uh, accelerate downward. The only thing that makes any sense at all from a scientific uh, perspective is that those towers were blown up. John made a mockery of mainstream sites, Nat Geo and Pop Mechanics, who've desperately tried, for instance, to show 175 pounds of military nanothermite couldn't break the columns. John did it with just one pound. Can thermite of any type burn through steel beams? I guess it can. Renowned librarian and researcher Elizabeth Woodworth has come in to help form the Consensus 9-11 panel, confirming it uses best practice with the most rigorous peer review. Thanks so much for joining us. There's this remarkably high consensus among experts that the government version can't be right. We have some of the top experts in the field who've published in uh, peer-reviewed scientific journals. And yet, these scientific journals exist, like the Herod study, but they're never covered in the media. If people knew about the research, uh, they would find it compelling. Dr. Griffin has said that he'd, he's never heard of anybody who saw the evidence became converted to this point of view and then changed back. Yeah, the panel's made government already change its story and admit Skyscraper 7's freefall. That's right. Uh, David Chandler uh, is an extraordinary uh, model maker. Chandler is on the panel and he devised a model to prove that the top floors so uh, fell with no resistance. There's only one way that that can happen, and that is that all the, the, the columns, there are 84 of these columns, that they were severed at the same moment. Dr. Graham McQueen accessed the New York Fire Department records from that day. Thanks very much for joining us. Never broadcast by mainstream media, but more than 100 witnesses have even reported the explosives bringing down the Twin Towers. Here was this roughly 10,000 pages of extremely rich eyewitness material. And I found that there were 118 people who clearly perceived explosions. You know, we have firefighters who are used to fighting high-rise fires, who are used to encountering, encountering smoke explosions and boilers. And yet they use words like bombs. You know, they don't identify with the things we would expect. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, it was like they were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. Bob McIlvain has wanted answers why the post-mortem of his son Bobby found his fatal injuries in the South Tower consistent not with fireballs, but explosives. Yet mainstream host Rachel Maddow here recently sneered he's not only a conspiracy theorist for asking questions, but also attempted to connect him to violence and Al-Qaeda. All of these nefarious conspiracies about government plots to kill and conspire and lie about it and cover up the real truth. I mean, this stuff is as ridiculous as it has ever been, but it is as ridiculous as it is dangerous. Bobby's father joins us. Thank you very much for speaking with us. How do you feel first losing your son and now being portrayed as the bad guy? My son died. He, he was, died from an explosion. I can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. If I was in a courtroom, I, a jury cannot not accept that as proof. So that's where we have our problem. And I say, well, this is an inside job. Well, my son died from an inside job from someone putting bombs detonations. I would make her sit in this room and go through what I just went with you. And then I would say, now you tell me I'm a conspiracy theorist. Just shows you how awful our media is. I don't want to call her a the media she makes over a million dollars and they tell her what to say. One uh, newspaper reporter and is from the Philadelphia area was very upfront with me. She said, you know, Bob, she says, as a reporter, I am the problem because we will lose our jobs. If I take that, just that little bit you just said, to the editor, he will crush it. 
So I'm, I'm telling you right now, I can't put your story out there. The media owners will not allow them. The press would not cover up just that because it put a little doubt in people's minds. Yeah, who do you blame for all this? The people in the United States are just as much to blame because they just want to believe that we are good people. We are an exceptional country. But this is what governments do. You know, it's very Machiavellian. Now we have an endless war on terror. I know what these people in Iraq, I know what these people in Syria, I know what these people in Libya, Afghanistan are going through because they're all losing children. And that's what it's all about. Everybody's losing family members. And it's pure hell. So that's it, Daniel. <laughs> Tomorrow, Congress votes to bomb Syria, the latest war of the post-9-11 era. The U.S. would now officially be Al-Qaeda's air force, notes former Congressman Kucinich. But America's had enough. Nine in ten oppose this invasion, the most unpopular in history. Regarding 9-11, a massive 84% now say the government's lying. We now have the precedents documented that government's prepared to commit supreme crimes against its population. Exactly what happened on 9-11 can be argued by both so-called conspiracy theorists and the authorities. What's beyond dispute is on the 11th of September, the world will join to mourn the almost 3,000 innocent people who lost their lives. This is The Truth Seeker. Of course, the uh, closing the closing moments of that video they showed the uh, what the 9/11 memorial site where they're going to have the uh, well they already had the opening the grand opening and guess what the general public has met it with uh, more or less disapproval they don't want to spend twenty four dollars to go and see the official story you know they're like, like the statistic just said, 84% of the population believes that 9-11, uh, they lied about 9-11. The official story is a lie. So, well, so we committed all our troops to go and fight and kill brown people wherever we could find them. And, uh, you know, whether you... <laughs> You know, whether you have humanity or not, and you appreciate how horrible that is uh, or not, our troops are still, you know, suffering. They, they get sent over there for eight or, or more tours. I mean, that's unheard of. I can't even imagine that. One tour is, is incredibly horrible. Imagine stacking them without relief. It's terrible. Well, does, you know, you hear all the time, I support the troops, I support the troops, you know, I'm against this, but I support the troops. You know, that, that's always something that you have to tack on at the end, you know, as if you really did support the troops. How do you support the troops? Does anybody really support the troops? What does support the troops mean? Well, we've got, here's a, uh, a clip from a show that I, I think I played one time. Uh, not, the, not the same clip, but the same source. It's uh, a, a site called Secular Talk with Kyle Kalinske, and we're going to, it's going to take about seven and a half minutes, and he's going to talk to us about, uh, does America really support its troops? We're going to do every Veterans Day on Secular Talk and give you guys what I think is some real perspective into the situation. In fact, I want to go ahead and take a look at some numbers in a second and try and determine if we're really supporting the troops. Because if you're in America, you know better than probably anybody living anywhere else that we have leaders who love to parrot that idea endlessly. That uh, we support the troops, the other side doesn't support them nearly as much as we do, and that's why you should vote for us, because we love our men and women in uniform and the other guys don't. And it's the same thing we've seen over and over in elections, and even when it's not uh, in election, just things that particularly Republican politicians casually say when they're leading. Look at Dick Cheney and George W. Bush. But are we really supporting the troops? And what does that mean? What does it even mean to say, I support the troops? Well, let's look into that. So there was a recent food stamp cut 
that we talked about on the show, it hurt 900,000 veterans. That wasn't even brought up in the mainstream media. Nobody ever brought that up and said, hey, maybe this is messed up that we're hurting these veterans. So is that supporting the troops? I don't think so. 285,000 veterans are going without unemployment right now. So they would be eligible for it, but they're going without it. And of course, this has to do uh, a lot with cuts, similar cuts to the food stamp cuts. This is the... Uh, unfortunately, something that Washington has been doing nonstop, particularly Republicans have been fighting for these things nonstop. Is that supporting the troops? Cutting the unemployment of 285,000 of them? There are 400,000 overdue compensation claims at the VA. So the hospital for the veterans. 400,000. Now, there was the story recently about how there's wait lists for some VA hospitals, and some of the wait lists are so bad that people are dying while they're on the wait list. Is that supporting the troops? I don't think so. In February, Republicans blocked a bill that would have created 27 new VA clinics. So that would, if that wouldn't have fixed the problem, it would have come close to it. It would have certainly helped to have 27 new VA clinics where people could go. Democrats proposed it, they pushed for it, they wanted it, they also wanted other things to help the veterans. The Republicans blocked it, they filibustered it. Is that supporting the troops? No. Uh, Alright, now here are the other two, that final two facts here that just, to me, are the most insane. With all that stuff going on that I just laid out for you, there are still 1.4 million U.S. troops on global active duty. 1.4 million. So understand what's going on here. We have brave, young, patriotic American men and women who are answering the call of duty and doing their jobs and not complaining and following orders and doing the right thing. 1.4 million of them all around the world in these different bases. So they're doing their part, but the country and the government are not doing their part for them because like I just laid out for you, 900,000 uh, affected by a food stamp cut, 285,000 affected by an unemployment cut, 400,000 overdue compensation claims at the VA, 27 new VA clinics blocked. So what's going on here? But the worst fact of all, how many homeless veterans are there in the United States of America today on this Veterans Day 2014? 49,993. So while today you'll turn on the TV and you'll see Democrats and Republicans and people of leadership, people with power in the country doing all these different, you know, whether it's parades or whether it's gatherings where we honor the veterans and there's some showmanship going on and there's stuff that, you know, is photogenic where, you know, hey, the media could tell, look at this great picture we took with somebody who was a hero from Iraq, yay, and you, you see leaders shaking their hands and whatnot. While you're looking at all of that and you hear these vacuous, vapid talking heads on TV... Uh, Talk about supporting the troops, but in no substantive way. They don't give you any details, they don't give you any numbers, they don't give you any information, they don't dive into the serious aspect of this conversation. When you see that, remember these numbers. Remember these numbers. And ask yourself, what does it really mean to support the troops? Here's my answer to that question. It's very simple. You only send brave young American men and women, patriotic, okay, you only send them to fight and die when you absolutely have to. It is, it should be, without question, the last resort in any situation. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Only when there's an imminent threat of attack against the nation should these people fight. Okay, because that's real patriotism. Not wasting the lives of brave young American men and women. See, that would be unpatriotic to me. That would be the opposite of supporting the troops, when you willy-nilly say, yeah, go to Iraq, go to Syria, we don't really have a clear plan, stay in Afghanistan, don't really have a clear plan there either, we'll do some drones in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, so we'll spare you from there, and we'll have 900 military bases around the world, and you'll just go sit in some of these places, sometimes hostile places, okay? Hostile places. Look, this is the problem, man. 
this is the problem. The problem is we're so militaristic and we're so imperialistic and it's the leader's fault. It's the military industrial complex's fault. It's not the fault of these soldiers. They're just doing their job. A lot of these people come from not privileged backgrounds and they need some money and they need a, a chance to create a better life and this is the best option available to them. And they're trusting the government and the state with their lives and then they violate that trust all the time. All the time. So that's how you support the troops, by only using them when you absolutely need to and also by addressing these problems with the social safety net. There shouldn't be a single veteran in the United States of America who's homeless. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Put a roof over all their heads. I'd pass a bill tomorrow that says that, okay? I would make sure all of them have food. Again, this isn't radical stuff. If you want to support the troops, you gotta fucking feed them if they need it. It's common sense, right? But nobody's gonna talk about that. And as you watch this and you're aware of the fact that nobody in the supposedly serious mainstream media is talking about that, you remember and you think about what it actually means to support the troops and the way to support the troops is like we just outlined. Only use them when you absolutely have to and fix the social safety net and get them out of poverty. If you, were, if you fought for this country bravely, in my book, you should never go a day in your life in poverty. Yeah. We have the ability, if, if we just didn't spend all that money on blowing things up, we have the ability to make life pretty darn nice for everybody, if we wanted to. The question is, why don't we want to? Well, what you've just heard about the, uh, you know, the situation of the veterans and, yeah, you know, how about 49,000 homeless vets? That's almost 1,000 per state, you know, and that's unacceptable. It, it just goes to show you that the government does not care about the troops. They only look at them as something they can use for their purposes and once their purposes are accomplished that is it. They no longer honor any of the commitments, any, you know, GI Bill, what's that, you know? Well, okay, so now you see all the corruption and so on in the military industrial complex well how about wall street that's part of the military industrial complex i guess but wall street has a special uh place of its own because of well the bank scandals and all that so here's bill black for the real news network and he's a great analyst you'll probably see him lots of more times if you keep watching my show and uh, he's always right on. He's going to talk about how deep is the rot on Wall Street. It's about 10 minutes. We'll be back. This is the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. And also welcome to this edition of the Bill Black Report, who's our next guest. He recently authored a blog titled, Zero Prosecutions Aren't Few Enough. Wall Street Wants SEC Sanctions Reduced to DMV Points. Now joining us to discuss this is Bill Black. He's an associate professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He's a white collar criminologist and a former former financial regulator. He's the author of The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. As always, thank you so much for joining us, Bill. Thank you. Good to be back. Bill, what are you blogging on this week? So Joseph Fischera is a head of a Wall Street advisory firm, and he is one of the sometimes good guys uh, that is, a, a, for example, warned about auction rate securities as a dangerous scam and criticized major investment banks for uh, derivatives that they've sold uh, to cities. So he's easily in the top 10% of the distribution uh, of uh, Wall Street CEOs. But even he, and that's sort of the point, uh, has just come out on November 6th and said, you know, we're treating Wall Street too harshly. Now, 
Wall Street, as we've talked about, has zero convictions of any of the uh, senior officers who actually led the fraud epidemics that caused the crisis. But that's not sufficiently weak for Fischera. He says that uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission should not uh, have the power to remove an investment bank's license to sell securities, for example, just because it's committed a massive fraud. Uh, instead, uh, frauds should have a schedule of points uh, like the Department of Motor Vehicles has in many states. And so, you know, for one act of appraisal fraud that could actually be thousands of acts, maybe you'd get four points. And uh, over the course of six years, if you got he doesn't give the number, but maybe 16 points, uh, then and only then could your license be removed. So this is the idea that um, fraud is really just like driving without your seatbelt. You know, there's no moral uh, element at all to defrauding other people of tens of billions of dollars. And that you actually have a right you're in finance, but only if you're in finance, uh, to a certain number of felonies before anything can happen seriously. And he explicitly says that uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission should have no power to remove your license if you've only committed one series of felonies. And remember, this series of felonies could be 10,000 people that you defrauded, or indeed millions of people that you defrauded, uh, but uh, it, like every dog gets its bite, uh, every corporation that uh, issues securities would get its massive fraud. And if it didn't get caught again within the next six years, well, then like DMV, your points would be eliminated and you could commit your new fraud uh, with impunity. On top of that, he says... Well, you know, we really have to uh, believe in this too big to jail and too big to sanction stuff uh, for the Securities and Exchange Commission because he says that there's a real uh, contradiction between the principles of financial regulation and the principles uh, of justice. Uh, in other words, uh, if we want to insist on justice, uh, we're going to have bad regulation because we're going to sanction big firms and then uh, those firms will fail uh, and therefore we'll have financial crises. And so the answer is to leave the frauds in power and not only to not prosecute them, but to make it very, very hard to take any serious enforcement action against them as well. Bill, is Fichera serious? Is this being taken seriously, such a proposal? He is absolutely dead on serious. Uh, and as I said, he's actually within uh, the valley of the morally blind, uh, the one-eyed king uh, type of thing. He's not one of the worst people in Wall Street by a very long margin. And this tells you how deep the rot is in Wall Street, that uh, somebody that is, as I said, you know, certainly in the best 10 percent of Wall Street CEOs uh, has such an absurd proposal in mind. Uh, your viewers who know the old uh, Roman maxim in Latin, you know, fiat justitia, Ruat Kalem, uh, let justice be done though the heavens fall. Now that might sound naive, but the best way to keep the heavens from falling is to insist on justice, particularly when the people who uh, are trying to escape accountability are immensely wealthy and politically powerful. So the best way to destroy a financial system is to leave the frauds in charge. That is going to produce what we call a Gresham's dynamic in which bad ethics drives good ethics out of the marketplace. And uh, he, uh, Fischera, actually admits that the repeal of Glass-Steagall, uh, which separated commercial and investment banking, was a disaster. 
And he admits that moving away from uh, what was the rule for hundreds of years, uh, that things like um, investment banks were owned as partnerships. And you had, as a general partner, what's called joint and several liability. That means you're responsible for all the debts of the company, whether you cause them or not. And of course, uh, under that system, you as a partner in one of these investment banks had an overwhelming incentive to police your fellow partners and making sure that they didn't screw up and take advantage of people. And you had an enormous incentive not to make new partners who didn't have the highest level of integrity because when they screwed up, again, you could lose your entire wealth. Um, so, you know, uh, as I said, this is not a crazy person, and, or at least is not normally considered a crazy person, who admits the problems and then wants to make them worse. Right. And what is the SEC's response to something like this? Well, the SEC is uh, not responding officially to this, but the, the, more, the broader point, of course, is it's not just the Justice Department that has not held people accountable. It, it is largely the SEC that has failed to hold people accountable as well. And in particular, the folks that they don't hold accountable are the most powerful um, Wall Street CEOs who led the fraud epidemics that caused the financial crisis. And, and you know, we know self-regulation or even demerit points of this sort uh, doesn't really work. Uh, what are some of the solutions you think that might work besides prosecutions? Well, the two things that would work really well are precisely what he talked about. Uh, we should bring back Glass-Steagall and we should bring back uh, real partnerships with joint and several liability. Uh, and both of those things would be uh, enormously beneficial. And so you would get, there's no tension between good financial regulation and the principles of justice. Uh, good financial regulation is impossible unless you hold the most powerful people in Wall Street responsible, uh, both criminally and uh, to uh, the best of your civil and enforcement powers when they commit these kinds of violations. So the best things to do are those things that create the right incentive structures so that people never screw up in the first place. And the big three things that you want to do are bring back Glass-Steagall, bring back joint and several liability in terms of partnerships, and fix modern executive and professional compensation, uh, which is extremely criminogenic. And then the fourth thing would be to end the international race to the bottom of financial regulation in which big banks try to put nations in competition with each other for who is willing to offer the weakest regulation. Bill, um, I think it would be wonderful if you would come back and we can dig into each one of your four recommendations uh, further and discuss what this really means in terms of being able to... We always have a lot more than we can show, so in, enjoy, and I'll see you next Saturday.